In this presentation, Max Matthews, his great gift to us all, FM synthesis with the context, its discovery in Louis Pasteur's dictum, breakthrough number one, spectral bandwidth, centroid, and loudness, breakthrough number two, brass tones in Jean-Claude Risset, loudness and temporal signature, Office of Technology License, finds Yamaha, Breakthrough number three, The Singing Voice in 1978. 1969, 83, one of Jean-Claude's great gifts to me and to us all. 1983, the DX7, about 100 really good Yamaha en engineers. And finally, what has not yet been explored, lots. Okay, so Max wrote, in his seminal paper in November 1963, which was given to me in 19, or in the same year, maybe December 19, and then I read it in January of the next year. And uh, the importance here is the computer as a source of material, musical sounds in contrast to the performance of ordinary instruments. Basically, what he's saying is with a loudspeaker computer, any sound can be produced, okay. And here's his diagram, which is the only thing I really understood in this article. And uh, because my background was altogether music, I think I had a high school geometry class and algebra class, but that was it. But this diagram uh, communicated something to me. And uh, here it is. What an incredible gift to all of us for me not having any background in electronics, not even a ham operator, with a computer, a DAC, and a loudspeaker, that's the whole story. That's what's in every device we carry around. And this was in 1948 when, this is what was fearsome to me, and that the men in the white coats, for, that was a, those were really scary guys because they knew so much. In those days we had this uh, saying that, well, it's the tyranny of the engineer. They, that's no longer the case, I'm happy to say. Uh, engineers have learned a lot from music, those of us who are musicians, and we continue to learn a lot from engineers. So now it's a happy relationship, but it wasn't always so. So this is a conceptually simple system, having three well-defined stages and pieces of machinery. And in this article, Max goes on to point out that in his first citation, Claude Shannon. And in that, here's the, the first use of the word bit in Claude Shannon's uh, Mathematical Theory of Communication. If the base two is used, the resulting units may be called binary di di digits or more briefly bits, a word suggested by J.W. Tukey, who was a colleague of Max and, and Claude Shannon's at Bell Labs. There's a nice article by Hans Dieter Luca from Aachen University that gives the history of sampling. It's not mathematically mathematics primarily, but it, it uh, gives us a couple pages of information about the pre pre precedence and um, back to 1848, in fact. So I recommend that article. Here's Max. Yeah, he, we lost him in April 2011, so he disappeared but he did not disappear. So discovery of FM synthesis was in November 1967. So I'm gonna play for you the, a few of the examples that I selected. Uh, let's see. And the context, I was looking for sounds in spatialization my first project was to try and make sounds 
seem to be from any point in a hem in a, in a, 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 a 360 degree plane. At that time, two channels were the standard, and we extended it to four channels. I labeled them according to the Cartesian co uh, coordinates because there was no there was no standard at that time. And the listener space is within the perimeter, the illusory sound space outside the perimeter. Someone suggested when I tried to create these patterns in the in this sound space that I use vector algebra. But as I said at the outset, I had no background in mathematics and vector algebra was had no meaning to me. So I sought a graphical solution. So I plotted points at a constant rate. So the changing radius then preserved the Doppler information and also the distance information. And the angular distribution was according to common practice of those days of, of distribution between speaker pairs. So velocity had a, a radial component and an angular component. So my work on spatialization was dependent upon the relationship between the direct signal and the, the reverberant signal, the collection of echoes. So I thought I'll try and f generate tones that had a change in frequency, since that is the most uh, salient uh, interference between direct and re reverberant uh, signals. So here's what I, I did. I generated a tone at, at 200 hertz, so now it's plus and minus 10 hertz. Now plus and minus 100 hertz. So we're listening in the time domain. Change of pitch is a function of time. So now plus and minus 200 hertz. Now, between each of these tests, I probably waited maybe anywhere from an hour to two hours. It was a time-shared machine. So there were lots of users, and the lowest priority was, of course, is that me? No, okay. Anyway, it's not bad, thank you. And it's probably a digital waveform, thank you. So. So plus and minus 200 hertz. And while I'm waiting, of course, I'm thinking, okay, what's the next step? Okay, well, let's make it faster. So instead of once per second, then two times per second. And now <clears throat> at 20 hertz. Well, now we're, I'm not so sure that we're still listening in the time domain. But certainly the preceding one, uh, hmm. yeah. Okay, clearly in the in the time domain, and twenty hertz begins to sound like a complex timbre motorboat. Now, at forty hertz. Because we become from the time domain, I can still imagine this or feel this in the time domain, but it's no longer very clear. Now at 200 hertz. Well, that sounded like the first one, almost. So what did the first one sound like? It sounded the same pitch. So in those days, we had distortions and speakers. There were all sorts of reasons that we might have heard this slightly more complex wave. And, uh, but 
I convinced myself that it wasn't the case, that this was really a function of the modulation. I had no idea about, at this point, about frequency modulation. I knew the term is a, because they had just arrived in car radios, so I, I knew how to get good music when we had an FM radio rather than AM radio, but that was it. I had no relationship of this understanding of this between what I was doing, the frequency modulation uh, formulas. So there it is. Well, I did a set of ex experiments, transposing up octaves, down octaves, changing the ratios of the frequencies. And uh, this is finally what someone explained was happening, an engineer. We went to a radio engineering text, pulled it out, and we related it to the frequency modulation formula. So it was altogether an ear discovery, and that's a very important point here, because I learned that uh, uh, our ears, or my ears, are, were my very best tool. So there's the deviation, and then the, delta, the modulation index, which is the ratio of the deviation to the modulating frequency. Okay, so spectral bandwidth is in centroid and loudness. What's the difference between a tone that's close at a given frequency and a tone that's distant? at the same frequency and the same loudness at the source. Well, for the listener, standing in front of these auditory images, there's simply a change in overall intensity. The spectrum changes little, some high frequency loss, compared to a tone at the same frequency, but now at reduced amplitudes, so we're looking over on the left scale, that is, musical dynamic. The difference is centroid. When there's less effort or less strike force or less bow pressure, velocity, breath pressure through horns, etc., there's a reduction in the bandwidth and especially the centroid. That is, the av if we gave weight to all the partials based upon their amplitudes, the kind of balance point would shift towards the lower frequencies. Well, it turned out that FM was a very powerful way to control that because there's one parameter, modulation index, which by itself controls bandwidth of the spectrum. So as you'll see, that's a very powerful parameter in the FM playbook. So now let's listen to an example of a surprise. So disappearing the distance as, as opposed to decreasing effort or breath pressure through the vocal folds. So the centroid is moving toward the low harmonics in that case. Now listen to the end point of each of those. Soft and near and far and loud. It's a subtle difference, but clearly important. Loudness being one of the, the most important of musical parameters, carries uh, attributes having to, of feeling and expression and uh, distance then allows us to place sounds at distance at a given loudness independent of the actual uh, intensity. So there's a scheme that is common, can be commonly used in typical source uh, loudness processing. The sound source 
is tapped, some small percentage, is sent to a reverber reverberator. The reverberator can be of, the, of any quality, even a spring reverberator works quite fine. But then we tap the direct signal after part of it's been sent to the reverberator and apply a distance control to it. So that's kind of the, the inverse square law. As we double the distance, the intensity decreases by one quarter. All right, so there's the formula. And there's the trigonometric expansion of the basic FM uh, formula. That is, what's computed is the upper one. And what nature does is seen in the lower one. So now we make amplitude an index, a function of time. Brass tones, Jean-Claude Risset, bandwidth, Citroid, and timbral signature. So we set the modulation index, square root of two in this case, times the carrier frequency, and exponential envelopes controlling the dick fall away, falling away of the modulation index and the amplitude of the carrier wave. And this is what we have. Two oscillators and simple controls. We make a change in the envelope shape. So now the amplitude envelope has a little rise right after the, after the onset. The modulation index quickly goes from something big to zero. Well, if the modulation index is at zero, that means it's just a sin sinusoid, which is being uh, amplitude modulated by the envelope in the carrier wave. So it sounds like this. Again, the mo modulating frequency is the square root of two times the carrier frequency. So the time constants are, of course, much shorter than the bell. And the overall durations are set as a function of pitch height. So the lower the pitch, presumably the larger the membrane, and the longer duration. So those are the changes. And the intensity, that is the musical dynamic, changes as a function of the modulation index. So something that's high and soft will have fewer partials than something that's high and loud. Brass tones. And this was a breakthrough. 1971, Jean-Claude Risset uh, explained to me what he had done in 1964 in the anal analysis of brass tones. And he discovered that during the onset of the brass tone, there's a rapid rise in the Harmonics, that is, the partials evolve such that during the 20 millisecond attack time, the, the first, second, third, fourth harmonic, fifths up to however many, depending on the, 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 the musical dynamic, but they follow in sequence. And I realized that I could do this very simply with frequency modulation synthesis by using the same envelope for the, carrier freak, for the carrier oscillator and the modulating oscillator. So during the attack, the modulation index goes from zero to its peak value. And when that happens, we have this evolution of 
of the partials complicated, as we'll see in a minute, the uh, Bessel functions, which I haven't mentioned yet, but they, they cause a rather complicated evolution of spectral components. And it turned out to be uh, an important attribute of this synthesis. So these are the, the carrier frequency now is one, and the modulating frequency is one, scaled by the whatever pitch frequency that is being produced. So <clears throat> now comes in mid brasses and then little cannon, and then low brasses. So it has all the attributes of brassiness, although not like any particular brass instrument. So this it was a confirmation of what Jean-Claude had discovered, because with quite a different technology, we were producing brassiness, and therefore we decided that this was a signature of brass tones this attribute of the rapid evolution of the harmonics during the attack. Well, when we think about it, it becomes pretty obvious. It's just that we, in all this synthesis uh, or acoustics books about musical instruments, no one had nailed it up until Jean-Claude's work. That is, the known uh, theories about brass tones were tested on the computers because we could test exactly. And that's what Jean-Claude in 1964 did and found that none of them sounded like a brass tone, more like an oboe. So finding this signature attribute of brassiness and a confirmation in quite a different context, that is with FM, um, was enough to make a claim. So Jean-Claude had nailed it, and we owe him much for that. Dexter Morrow, one of our colleagues who was a composer working at, at uh, Colgate University at the time, uh, saw what I had done. Dexter Morrow is a trumpet player, a very good one. And he took this basic um, algorithm two oscillators, one modulating the other, equipped with these basic brass-like envelopes that I had uh, discovered. And he added pitch change through the course of the tone. And he built a, a system where the more, the, <coughs> the greater the musical loudness, the greater the index, and so relating effort to spectral bandwidth and centroid, as I had done earlier, but now in the hands of a good trumpet player, these rather astonishing, this astonishing uh, piece of work by Dexter Morrow. You hear the effort. Uh, so clearly he had, had a very, very great sense. Okay, so now there's an interesting story behind this. Working with Dexter at that time was a young French composer, Jackie Lancino. And uh, he then came to Stanford and he worked uh, alongside me as I was working on a piece of Fonet, which I'll speak about in a moment. And he went back to Paris and he went to IRCOM and they asked him to be a tutor. Gerald Bennett knows these stories. At the time, big composers came to IRCOM and they were given tutors who basically told them what they could do. The composer decided he wanted it or not, then the tu tutor implemented it. But the uh, composers 
didn't get their hands very dirty. And most of them, I would say, were pretty arrogant and treated the tutors as one might expect. Jonathan Harvey was the exception. He was always paid attribution to those who helped him. But when Cherry went to IRCOM, uh, York Holler, is that right? A composer was doing a commission. They heard Dexter's uh, brass tones, and Cherry said, well, I know how he did that. And so he got a position at IRCOM being a tutor for York Holler. Um, I don't know whether attribution was paid, I hope so, but it doesn't matter. The fact is that the consequence of Dexter's good work made its way into IRCOM, and uh, it had good effect, I think. Now, how are the partials determined? Well, as I said earlier, nature does the work. The computation of these FM uh, sounds is very, very simple. But to explain it, we have to uh, understand a little bit of how, how Bessel functions or how the partials are acted upon by nature. And the common representation in electrical engineering texts, we have a given index. If it's zero, there's no modulation. And the first order Bessel function determines the amplitude of the carrier, of the carrier wave. Now, how, here we see the modulation index at one. Or now, so we look at the index along the abscissa at the intersection of the index with the Bessel function is at about 0.9. The second sideband components with an index of one are determined by the, by the second order. The third, where the index intersects with the Bessel function, the third or lower, upper lower sideband components and so on. And beyond that value, there's no, they're not significant. So if we have a modulation index increasing from one to, to two, then we have greater and greater bandwidth. So remember this one, because it looks like something we see in musical instruments and voices. It looks like a resonance. Okay. So here, here's a, a tone that has a carrier frequency of 500 and a modulating frequency of 100. The pitch frequency we hear is 100. But the mathematics show us that low order sideband components have a negative sign. Now, with radio engineering text, we never see that negative sign. It's, it's ignored because it's um, not pertinent to radio, radio frequency modulation, but it turns out to be in FM, and I'll give an example and a quick tour, and I'll show you everything that you need to know about FM and sidebands and Bessel functions. Okay, so for negative sign, we flip the phase. The third order lower sideband fre frequency similarly has a negative sign. So we flip the phase. What's it sound like? It sounds the same because in this condition our ears, our, our auditory system is insensitive to phase. So the carrier to modulating ratio is five to one. Modulating frequency remains at 100 hertz the carrier frequency is changed from 500 to 100 hertz. Right. So we have the sh same shape of the spectrum. The amplitudes of the sideband components don't change because the modulation index hasn't changed. But now we have two sideband components. The 
for second and third, which are in the negative frequency domain. So there's a, neg there's a trigonometric identity, minus sine theta equals sine of minus theta. So we flip the phase. So what was minus 100 now is, goes into the positive domain with the change in phase. What was at minus 200, this goes we here in the plus 200 with the change of phase. Take the algebraic sum of this two. This is what it sounds like. Same pitch, but different timbre because of the reflected components around, around uh, zero hertz. Another one. We begin at the same point. We move it down. So the carrier frequency at 100 hertz. But now we're going to change the modulating frequency to be three times the modulating fre uh, carrier frequency. So notice the amplitudes of the sideband components don't change at all because the index hasn't changed. But now we have a big spread between the partials of 300 hertz. We flip. So at minus 200, into two, it lands at 200 hertz. There's no component there, so it's a simple spectral addition. Minus 500 becomes, or the component at minus 500 in the negative frequency domain flips around zero and flips its phase. And then the one at minus 800 hertz, the same. Now we take the magnitude of the spectrum. This is what we hear. Okay. So there's a pattern. One, two, no third. Fourth and fifth harmonic, no sixth. Seventh and eighth, no ninth, etc. Okay, in harmonic spectra, we start again with a ratio of five to one, flip the phases, but now we're going to spread not from 100 to 300, to, but from 100 to um, the golden ratio times 100, about 162. So the interval between the sideband components, the partials, is always the, multiple, uh, is always the modulating frequency. So we flip the phrases again. They fall in between, close to but not on the partials in the positive domain. Take the magnitude of the spectrum. So we have an inharmonic spectrum, which is the way we created the bell tone, bell-like tone. But the change in, the, in that case, the envelope determined the, the timbre, timbral signature. Okay, so when we move an index in time, let's watch what happens. Here begins at index at zero and moves from one from zero to four. Once more. So now all the components produce a surprisingly simple sound. So when I heard this in the early days and when I first made this discovery, I thought uh, this is an attribute that was at the moment, at that time unknown to be able to create a tone that has the, uh, some sense of a diphthong. Ooh, ooh, ooh. 
Ooh. And I knew that digital filters in those days were ill-behaved. And in any case, none of them could produce a tone that had a, a pure tone as the beginning, like a pure sinusoid. So this is the Bessel function space, which is mostly useful in FM synthesis, indexes from, from 0 to 10. The power of FM synth synthesis was computational, processor speed, that is, it required very little processor, efficient computation. Memory, it required very little mem memory, few stored functions, a qu one quarter of a sine wave, and piecewise linear envelopes. The aliasing, a band limited signal is a function of one parameter, the index of modulation. And aliasing was a big issue in those days because sampling rates were relatively low. The musical importance, few but perceptually salient parameters, time varying dynamic spectra, harmonic and inharmonic spectra, the simple coupling of intensity and bandwidth and or centroid center of mass of the spectrum, which is one of the things about the DX7 which got Yamaha's attention that we could do that and of course they implemented that. Okay, so where are we? We're the Office of Technology Licensing finds Yamaha. So I had a previous patent at, through Stanford for the spatial uh, processing, the moving sound sources, which didn't make much money, but it made enough to buy us a four-channel tape recorder and four speakers and amplifiers. Um, at the time that I did the brass tones, I went again to the Office of Technology Licensing, and I told them that we, I thought there was a potential in this, in this algorithm. Um, they did searches and found engineers at uh, Hammond, came to listen to it. They were all impressed, but they, their only question was, how many chips does it take me to implement it? And I explained that I had no idea. I was playing a software implementation. I showed it the program. Basically, they had no understanding of the digital domain. So then Lowry and Wurlitzer and a, a, an Italian company came, none of whom understood digital domain. And in 1973, uh, a graduate student in business did a little research for the Office of Technology and Licensing and found out that the largest mu instrument manufacturer in the world was Yamaha, but their presence in the United States was very small, and, uh, but they were the major producer of electronic organs, no synthesizers at that time, but the organs were almost entirely sold in Japan as part of their Yamaha Music School System programs. Basically, you teach children to play keyboards and then they get them to buy an organ. And when they get better, they buy a bigger organ. And uh, then they, they were mostly not, yeah, I would say probably mostly women, young girls, and they, finally they, they do something else. So it was a big, big industry and they sent an engineer to Stanford from LA. And I explained what I was doing in about 10 minutes. He understood very well what, what the idea was. And um, because they had been preparing for the future, even though the technology worldwide and in, in um, large scale integration had not had not appeared at that point, but they knew that it would. They understood Moore's law, and so he understood the application. They were already thinking about uh, digital synthesis using sums of sinusoids or stored waveforms. They went back to, he went back 
to Japan, and there was a, a great interest, and I went off to Berlin for a year and got a call while I was in Berlin from uh, the Office of Technology Licensings telling me that the managing director and a young engineer wanted to talk to me, and could I explain to them how I got these brass tones and other tones, the bell, drums, etc. Um, so I had no, no computer, I had no tape recorder, all I had was tapes. So we went to the Kufustendam, at the, that time that was the major street in Berlin, and I asked uh, an audio store if I could explain to these two gentlemen from Japan uh, what I was doing, that I needed a tape recorder, could go off in the corner and put a tape on one of their tape recorders, and they said yes. So we went in and I put the tape on the tape recorder and started playing these tones, and then some other German people sort of got interested and they gathered around and pretty soon there was a small crowd and uh, so I was explaining in English to this young engineer, Hiro Kato, then he explained to the managing director in Japanese and so there was plenty of time for little discussions I could sort of hear what people were asking and I answered their questions and this was all completely no, no one had ever heard computer music before. And uh, so, here's the guy. Hiro Kato was the one, the second from the left. The managing director is on my left side. Hiro Kato was commissioned with another young engineer, Aki Endo, who was on the, f the far right, to make a synthesizer, a digital synthesizer. Andy Moore had designed a monophonic digital synthesizer, digital circuit using the SAIL Artificial Intelligence Laboratory uh, design program. And they built it. I went and saw it in 1974. By then it was an eight-voice uh, polyphonic synthesizer. And probably in the history of a digital synthesis, that was the first that, uh, that was ever built, although it never was a, it was a research system. But as far as we know, that was the first ever all digital synthesizer. So some of the schematics from the, they called it the MAD project, and I forget what the acronym meant. Uh, the earliest example of FM synthesis in popular music was the GS1 keyboard, and. Toto's Africa, and probably the most exuberant of the DX7 early recordings was uh, Cassiopeia's Eyes of the Mind. It's kind of fun to watch because it's, it's such an exuberant group. This is Hiro Kato's uh, 2005 remembrance of the the development of FM synthesis at Yamaha. Uh, I'll leave this slide set so you can have a chance to look at it more carefully. Uh, Max Matthews, the kind of the, the sequence in the history of FM. Uh, notice that they too ignored the odd ordered lower sideband frequencies. They're, they don't uh, show the the phase change. This is uh, Andy Moore, me, Max Matthews, Pierre Boulez in 1975 when your comp team, Gerald was among them, uh, came to Stanford for a two-week course in, in using the PDB-10 <coughs> system, which at that time was the most well-developed in the anywhere. So the beginning and working together, FM development conditions to be met. The first serious product evaluation in LA, improvements made from GS1 to DX7, and certainly one of the most important was feedback FM. And that was, uh, a, func that was a product of one of the engineers, a super smart 
um, LSI de designer, and he figured out how to do that. Uh, that about that time, IRCON got their PDP-10, that Jean-Claude Brisset, John Pierce, who was Max's director at Bell Labs. In fact, he was the director of research and coined the term transistor because the four guys that invented the transistor were under his direction. And uh, the two people who did the factory voicing for the DX, first DX7, David Bristow and Gary Lewenberger, um, so the biggest application of the FM technology finally was ringtones for cell phones. Uh, current status of the synthesis, synthesis world, this was 2005. So here's the question. Dans les champs de l'observation, le hasard ne favorise que les esprits préparés. So that commonly translated in English as chance favors the prepared mind. But note that there's a que, and uh, only the prepared mind. So the question is, was my mind repaired, prepared? 30, 10, 30. And why, in 1967, when I explained this to Max and Jean-Claude wrote down the date, which is the only way that I kn knew when I, about when I had done this, because I kept notes, but I did not have the habits, as do engineers and scientists, of dating their notes. So it was December 17th, 1967, when I explained it to them. Um, they knew very well FM uh, modulation theory. After all, that Armstrong had, I think, was at Bell Labs at some point, or maybe RCA, but anyway, it was well known. So no one had the insight. Jim Tenney had, to, had written an article in 1963 before Max's article in the Yale Journal of Music Theory and uh, no one had seen the pot potential. And I think that it was the fact that I did not have this idea about where a carrier frequency ought to be. That, so I was naive. I had no prejudice to carrier frequency. And uh, in fact, when I made the discovery, was, I wasn't aware of the fact that it was carrier frequency. It was just a vibrato with a center frequency is the way I thought about it. So it's a big mystery why it, uh, that was not realized at Bell Labs and perhaps elsewhere. But it was not a direct path. I mean, it took, we, we, to, between the discovery and realizing that I could produce the brass tones, that was five years. And then the voices, which were the next great breakthrough, was in 1987. So, the singing voice, spectral modeling. So the top is the a beginning of a vocal crescendo. The second is at the end of a vocal crescendo, and you see what's happened is that the energy has, shift, has shifted to the seventh harmonic. Well, remember this one? That looks very much like part of that spectrum. And remember this one? Looks very much like that part of the spectrum. So if we put two carrier oscillators together, one with the carrier frequency set at the pitch frequency and the other at the seven times the pitch frequency, make the spectrum into log frequency, we get a good match. So that's how I built the singing voice. So now we're going to listen to the singing voice, first just the fundamental, then all the harmonics, 
based upon this model, which I just explained. But it's not a singing voice until we add micromodulation on a mix of periodic and random vibrato. So here's the example. And then it becomes a singing voice. So when I did this in, at IRCOM, having been invited by the IRCOM team, Gerald, Jean-Claude, and others to work for some months there, this was a pretty surprising example because it showed how important these small variations that are a function of nature in all that we do, whether it's the singing voice or as Dexter discovered in brass tones, everything's in, in flux all the time. There is no perfectly stable tone or spectrum. So these small modulations turn out to be very important and help us identify sources so until that moment, we didn't hear a, a soprano until the appearance of the micromodulation. So let's listen to it once more. Sinusoid, then all the partials, except it sounds like we pulled an organ stop, an electronic organ. <coughs> then it has the attributes of, of a singing voice. So Steve McAdams wrote a dissertation on this and some very nice uh, conclusions which is available through the Stanford online at Stanford through the through the um, Stanham series. So what's going on? These are the Gestalt principles of, of percep uh, perceptual organization and the one that's operating in this case, is common fate. Don't blink. All right, so now we're going to hear three sopranos, each of which begins with a pure tone at four, five, six hundred hertz. And when do we hear three sopranos rather than uh, just a big collection of harmonics. So we hear three voices when each voice has its own synchronous micromodulation, but it's different between the three voices. Another visual analogy, look for these three singers in this random pattern. So, source segregation. Sing, the singing voice, this is what we hear on the bottom, and this is what we infer, the resonances. From the larynx to the opening of the mouth, the cavity, and then some secondary resonances in the sino-cavity. So here are four vowels, a group of singers. Do you hear the effort for the high voices? As with the dexter and the trumpet, we accommodate, make that hap, make that uh, the conditions such that the uh, higher voices, where sopranos have to uh, produce a lot of breath pressure through the vocal folds. 
so an increase in the centroid of the spectrum. So those uh, vocal tones uh, got Pierre Boulez's interest, and maybe the only kind of uninterrupted discussion I ever had with him was at a very early on a Sunday morning, maybe at six o'clock, and I was working in one of the studios, and and uh, the big door opened, and he pushed his head in, because at that time, whatever sound was made and computed in one studio was played through the whole building. And uh, he had been had, having discussion with um, Maurice Béjar. So they came in, and Béjar listened. Pierre asked me what, how, well, how he was doing it, and I explained. But it was a very nice, calm time. Probably the only one hour dis kind of under a discussion I ever had with Pierre Boulez. Okay, just about finished. One of Jean-Claude Grisset's great gifts to me and to everyone else. Phone and voices are rooted, two of my pieces are rooted in an idea of structured spectra, first elaborated by John Pierce in Eight-Tone eight -tone Canon and by Jean-Claude Risset in Mutations in 1969. But in Jean-Claude's case, it was a rather different uh, application of this idea, and I'll show you what, what, why it was so important. In his work, Mutation, Risset defined a relationship of timbre to pitch, where sets of pitches also become the spectral components of a sound, yielding a magical, never-before-heard functional relationship in the pitch-timbre space. So just a year ago, we lost Jean-Claude, who had much to express and much to teach. He composed mutations in which occurs a seamless link between pitch and timbre. This pitch, timbre, pitch structure, impossible to achieve without the precision and generality of the computer that became the underlying idea of phonet. So here's the example, a melody which we hear as a chord, as it's sustained, and given a crescendo de crescendo. And then it's followed by a gong-like timbre, where the frequencies of the gong are the very pitches that were used in the melody, preceding melody. So this can't happen. There's no possible way that a gong could ever be produced that uh, is compo composed of partials that are based upon the pitch space. So there's a imprint of the pitch space in the timbre of the gong. So that's the opening of mutations. And if you want to hear the magical things that he did with this, and you should listen to the rest of the piece. So that brought me to this, oh, one of, so I took Jean-Claude's idea of the, the pitch space forming the timbral space of a bell, only this time rather than just a decaying away, and they be, take decay away and then grow again, and they acquire the attributes of a singing voice through the, te the technique which I've already shown you. So we introduce the mo mo micromodulation, then it fades away, and we have a damp sinusoid at the end. So this are, these are two very distant points in its timbre, timbral space, uh, idiophone and the singing voice. So a collection of these, I'll let that be represented by change of hue, and we put that with now in the pitch space, others that evolve in a similar way but not synchronously. So now a collection of soundiosoids sound like a single bell, then a chorus of voices. And 
and at the end like a idiophone. So that was one of the components of phone. The other is extrapolation, producing spectra that are like a um, male <coughs> uh, bass tone, but with the amount of energy that could not be produced by a human being because there's no resonance system that's large enough to amplify it. So in this case, it would be a, a meter long, meter long throat, a big pumpkin head. Okay, so that's my basso profundissimo. And again, it has it has this attribute of reaching down, not just trying to produce a low tone that's not so easily done because the energy at those low tone, at the, with these low frequencies uh, is not reflected by the vocal tract. So this is the opening of phone. So that gong now will become mid mid uh, range male voices, the big low gong will be basso profundissimi. Okay, so so Fonne is a play upon this is Colonel idea that was given to me by Jean Claude. The DX7. So there it is. Um, <coughs> so if anyone would like to play it, you're welcome. I can't. <laughs> 